Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ken Davis. I'm Dean of the University of Wisconsin Law School, and it's my uh, privilege and honor to welcome everyone to uh, this year's uh, Fairchild Lecture. Uh, today, as we all know, uh, marks the first of the, uh, lecture in this series that we are without the uh, presence of the man who this, uh, who this lecture honors, Judge Thomas E. Fairchild, who passed away last February. Uh, everyone in the state is a direct beneficiary of, of Judge Fairchild's passionate com commitment to justice in his combined 50, 50 years on the Wisconsin Supreme Court and the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. Uh, we at the law school are doubly fortunate uh, as we are the beneficiaries of Tom Fairchild's close mentoring relationship with his, with his clerks. It was because of uh, Judge Fairchild's Im uh, immense impact on his clerks uh, that they got together to create this lecture series, which is now in its 19th year. It has brought to our law school some of the country's uh, most important and pro provocative legal minds, and it has also provided along the way several uh, memorable and remarkable moments. Uh, anyone here today who was also at our Fairchild Lecture one year ago uh, probably remembers well the vivid, dramatic uh, presentation by Judge Joan Lefko. Uh, and two of her clerks, in which they took the voices of Judge Fairchild and others uh, throughout various phases of his career. Um, then there was the event uh, several years back that uh, uh, recalled the restructuring of the Wisconsin Democratic Party in the 1950s. Um, uh, I have uh, uh, vivid memories of the, uh, the judge reminiscing with Gaylord Nelson, uh, Pat Lucy, uh, and others in what I thought were uh, humorous and instructive and collegial uh, reflections upon their shared experiences driving around the state. Um, indeed, several of us thought that if we didn't turn out the lights, they would, uh, they would never stop. <laughs> it's been a, a truly remarkable series over the years, uh, and we thank the clerks for their work in carrying it on. Uh, we will all miss Tom Fairchild, but we hope that through this lecture series we can continue to honor his memory, his spirit, his achievement, and his principles. Uh, so right now, before um, we move on to um, our wonderful speaker, I want to call upon uh, John Skilton and Bill Conley for a special presentation. to have this series over the years in honor of such a great mentor to all of us. I'd like to recognize members of the Supreme Court who are here. Chief Justice Abrahamson is here. I saw her. I think I saw her anyway. There she is. Uh, uh, Justice Bradley is here. <laughs> Justice Butler. Uh, have I missed any? Uh, and I want to thank them particularly. <laughs> oh, did I misspeak? I apologize. I want to recognize the court especially because they uh, afforded us time to make a presentation uh, on, in the honor of Judge Fairchild at the uh, session of the court several weeks ago. Uh, I would also like to thank the Law Review for all its years of service. We have now uh, been able to get the number one spot in every issue, uh, and it's taken some time and a little credibility, I think, along the way. But uh, in particular, I'd like to um, uh, honor uh, Emily Chow, uh, Andy Martinez, and David Saltzman. Are, are they here uh, today? If they could stand. <laughs> this wonderful uh, booklet that you have is the work of the Law Review and with its permission has been printed. Uh, Emily in particular took uh, personal responsibility for the In Memoriam uh, tributes, uh, and uh, on behalf of the clerks, I thank them very much for their years of loyalty to the lecture, but most particularly for the uh, particular publication here. 
And then I would be totally remiss not to thank the folks at the law school uh, for all of the support they've given this lecture series. Uh, Dean Davis, uh, Dave Schultz is here, if he would stand. Uh, and Lynn Thompson, who has been the person who has, I think, fairly put, held it all together over all the years. And we thank them. <laughs> to the law school and to the dean. Uh, this uh, picture of the judge and a portion of this is dedicated to the Fairchild Lecture Series and I'm hope that, hopeful that the dean can find an appropriate place. It's now my pleasure to introduce this year's uh, Fairchild Lecturer, Judge Diane Wood of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. She, is a, a, she received both her uh, BA and JD degrees from the University of Texas, and following her law school graduation, embarked upon a highly distinguished legal career that included clerkships uh, with the, both the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit and with Justice Blackmun at the U.S. Supreme Court. Following that, she practiced law in the District of Columbia, uh, both with the State Department and the law firm of Covington and Burling, uh, and then was appointed to uh, the law school faculties at both Georgetown and the University of Chicago. Uh, she is an expert in uh, antitrust law, civil procedure, and trade, uh, international trade, and immediately before her appointment to the bench, she was Deputy Assistant Attorney General um, in Washington in the Antitrust Division of the U.S. Uh, uh, Department of Justice. So we are indeed fortunate to have somebody uh, who can bring all of that sort of experience to bear uh, with this year's uh, Fairchild Lecture. So, Judge Wood. very much, Dean Davis, members of the Fairchild family, Fairchild clerks, uh, and all of you. It's really a great honor and pleasure to be here with you this afternoon to deliver the 19th of these lectures. I had hoped very much uh, when I was invited to do this that the judge himself would have been able to be with us, uh, but unfortunately, uh, as the dean has said, that was not to be. Nonetheless, for anyone who is even remotely associated with the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, it will be a very long time before you can think of that court without thinking at the same time of Judge Fairchild. The court itself opened its doors on June 16, 1891, almost 116 years ago. Judge Fairchild's official commission was August 11, 1966. He served and contributed actively to the court's work literally up until the date uh, that he passed away, February 14th uh, of this year. That's almost 41 years, and I know lawyers aren't good at math, but uh, 41 years out of 116 is actually more than, a, more than a third of the time that the court has been in existence. Judge Fairchild was there. He began his service on the Seventh Circuit at a time when the federal courts as an institution were starting to experience dramatic change. His colleague and mine, Judge Richard Posner, has suggested that the year 1960 was a turning point in the history of the federal judiciary. This is one of Judge Posner's uh, many books, uh, the book The Federal Courts Challenge and Reform. Uh, and it's actually very interesting, even though it's about a decade old at this point, interesting look at the history of the federal courts. 
looking at it myself, I think maybe that is when the ship began to, to turn around a bit um, for reasons that we can discuss, but it was right about that time, 1966, that Judge Fairchild left the Supreme Court of Wisconsin and joined his colleagues in Chicago. And for that reason, it struck me in preparing for this lecture that Judge Fairchild's experience on the Seventh Circuit really offers us a window, it's a microcosm, into the modern story of the federal judiciary as a whole. So I thought I would outline some of those broader changes in the federal judiciary, and then, because it's certainly impossible in the time that you would want to listen to me anyway, to, to review every case that Judge Fairchild authored over 41 years, um, I just took decades, you know, the first decade that he was there, and then looking to see how the court itself was evolving, what the job of a federal judge was, was doing over the time the judge served on the court. The changes are, in fact, dramatic, and it strikes me that it might help us to understand why, for example, uh, the process of selecting judges today is seemingly so much more contentious than it was back in the 1960s, why so much more attention is being paid to the courts of appeals uh, than was paid back then, and how the job of a federal judge itself has changed, the, kind of the day-to-day -day job, uh, in some ways for better, in some ways perhaps for the worse. So let me look first at the evolution of the federal courts in general. Those who followed the annual reports that the Chief Justice of the United States uh, issues every year, usually at the end of the year, know that federal judges today regard themselves as overworked and underpaid. I'm not sure that that distinguishes us from, from many of the rest of the people in this room, but, but that is, that's a fact. Uh, the Supreme Court justices have been testifying lately at Congress about this, this problem, and one sees the occasional newspaper editorial about it. Well, is this for real or not? So I thought I would just give you a few numbers. I'm gonna try not to drown you with them. But the numbers tell quite a startling story. In 1960, for the entire country, the number of cases that were begun in the courts of appeals was 3,899. That's the whole country. By 1966, the numbers were already swelling considerably. It had jumped up to 7,183. And then if we soar ahead to 2005, which is the last year that statistics are available uh, from the administrative office, the number had, had grown to 68,500. So over the years, essentially, that Judge Fairchild was on the court, it went from 7,000 cases a year, more or less, to 68,500, 6,200 terminations. So this is an enormous change. Um, and it had a profound effect on the work of the court. Actually, in the last year that uh, these statistics are available, while the judge was still on the court, the Seventh Circuit alone had 3,700 cases, the same number that the entire country did when he began his service on the court. So the question is, who's been doing all of that work? And if you said the judges, you would only, unfortunately, be partly right. Um, certainly the absolute number of federal judges has increased since 1960 or 1966. But the number of judges as a percentage of the total workforce of the judicial branch of government, of Article III, if you will, has shrunk. Uh, although I was speaking earlier with some people, the, the overall numbers are so small when you consider the size of the federal budget. But in, in 1965, the judiciary employed, I mean, this is from everybody, from people who empty the wastebaskets on up to the Supreme Court justices, employed 6,461 people, of whom 394 were Article III judges. That means district court judges, court of appeals judges, and the Supreme Court. In 2005, the total workforce of the judiciary had mushroomed up to 34,000 and some people, and the total number of Article III judges had grown, and, that, and I'm including, I'm assuming that there are no vacancies, which is not true, there usually are some vacancies, and I'm counting the senior judges, about which I'm gonna say more in a minute. But the total number of judges was about 1,350. So by percentages, this means the number of judges had shrunk from 6% six, um, six or so of the, of the total workforce to about 4%. Now, each circuit judge in 1960, and for some time thereafter, was entitled to one law clerk. It's 
some of the people who are here probably remember the one law clerk era. In 1970, the number went up to two law clerks for the circuit judges, and it wasn't until 1980 that the number reached three, which is the number that we still have. I have three law clerks. Uh, some judges have four law clerks, but they do that by using the money that's allocated to a secretarial spot for a fourth law clerk instead. And some judges, maybe some students at the University of Wisconsin do this, use externs, which is a nice way of saying uh, law students who are willing to work for no money, um, <laughs> who, who perform roughly the same function as law clerks. At the Court of Appeals level, we don't have anything that's the equivalent of magistrate judges. So this judicial work that I'm describing, that had exploded up to such a high number, is being done typically today by a circuit judge and maybe three law clerks, maybe four. Um, so that's, that's one thing. We certainly have some more help, but the caseload is very, very much larger. Then the other thing that's happened is that the nature of the work has changed. Um, and we're going to illustrate this by looking at, at Judge Fairchild's decisions in a minute or two. But in general, uh, I can make two general points. First of all, uh, in the early 1960s, there were pretty much no civil rights cases. Actions under the Civil Rights Act and the statutory civil rights cases that are just the bread and butter of the federal courts these days were not being filed, partly because some of the legislation hadn't been passed. Remember, you know, Judge Fairchild takes his oath of office in 1966. Well, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was barely dry on the books at that point. It had really hardly begun to be tested in the district courts. People didn't know, you know, what did Title VII, which prohibits discrimination based on race or religion or sex or national origin, what did that mean? Um, this was brand new at that time. So you didn't have that group of cases. And the other thing that you didn't have was habeas corpus cases. And I mean from state prisoners as well as federal prisoners. You could find a few, an infinitesimally small number, but they really just weren't there. Um, for nearly a century, the law was originally, this tells you something right away, title, uh, I'm sorry, section 1983, 42 USC 1983, the general federal civil rights statute, known as the Ku Klux Klan Act of April 20, 1871. That's an interesting reminder of what it was passed to address, but it lay practically dormant. It was not until 1961, when the Supreme Court decided a case called Monroe versus Pape, that it began to <coughs> take on the, the contours that we're familiar with today. That was a case that uh, broadened the idea of how much of a remedy you were supposed to get under Section 1983. Uh, professors Fallon, Meltzer, and Shapiro, who are now the authors of, of one of the most widely used federal courts case books in the country, the Hart and Wexler Federal Courts in the Federal System book, note that prior to Monroe, litigation under 1983 was infrequent. One commentator reports that there were only 19 cases in the U.S. Code annotations under Section 1983 in its first 65 years. The number of cases then started to grow very substantially right about the time that Judge Fairchild joined the court. Um, now, in contrast, just to give you, you know, where we are today, uh, again, these recent 2005 statistics from the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts show a total of 36,096 private civil rights actions filed and another 16,000 and some prisoner civil rights petitions for a total of about 52,000 cases. All right, six, you know, 19 in 65 years versus 52,000 in a year is, uh, <laughs> you hardly need uh, to, to say more. Um, the numbers for the courts of appeals, of course, follow that. I'm talking about cases started in the district court. Not everything gets appealed. Many things do, though. So the picture is similar for habeas corpus. I think um, despite the fact that both Congress and the Supreme Court are constantly trying to restrict the number of habeas corpus petitions filed, uh, I can tell you personally that those efforts don't seem to be bearing as much fruit as, as their authors thought they might bear. Um, we still get very large numbers of, of these petitions and uh, 
So it, it remains to be seen if anything will ever reduce those numbers. But habeas corpus was also pretty much an unknown thing until a couple of cases the Supreme Court decided, one in 1953 called Brown versus Allen uh, that expanded the notion of how a federal court might re-examine what a state court had done in a criminal case. And then a case called Fay versus Noya decided in 1963, which took a very forgiving view over what we would now call procedural default. If you hadn't done something right in the state court, was the federal court still entitled to look at it? Now, Fay versus Noya is history at this point. It's been overruled both statutorily and through decisions. But the floodgates that it opened up have actually not really changed. Um, just to give you again the sense uh, of what Fay versus Noya did, in 1960, just before the judge came to the Seventh Circuit, there were 871 petitions for habeas filed in the whole country at the district court level. 1965, the number had gone up to 4,845. And in 19, uh, sorry, in 2005, you're at 30,700 and some. So this was, I mean, and the 2005 number is after all of these restrictive efforts that I'm describing. So this is a very, very big part of, of our docket. And it was, again, really in its infancy at the time uh, that Judge Fairchild joined the Seventh Circuit. Now, Maybe this growth would have been absorbed very easily if the number of judges had grown proportionally to the caseload, although some wonder about that, because if you get too many people, we all know it's kind of hard to, to coordinate a very large number of people. But that is not, as I was saying earlier, that's not what happened. Um, the growth in the judiciary has been much slower than the growth in the caseload. So what do you do? Well, you really only have one solution that's an acceptable solution, and that's to become more efficient. You could also, as the economists would tell you, just create a very long queue, a long line, and, and delay, but that's not a very good solution. So what have we done to become more efficient? This, too, has changed remarkably the way that the courts of appeals do their work since the mid-1960s. When Judge Fairchild first sat in the Seventh Circuit, Oral argument was a given in every case. Of course you had oral argument. That's what you did if you were a court of appeals. In the end, if you look at some of his early opinions, it's very interesting. Some of the people who were arguing were not lawyers. They were what we call pro se. They were the actual party whose case was before the court. Maybe three times since I've been on the court of appeals, which is almost 12 years now, have we heard pro se arguments. We just don't hear pro se arguments, but they did then. Um, so oral argument was a given, and, this, and the Seventh Circuit, by the way, nationally, is a very generous court uh, for oral argument. Some circuits only hear oral argument in maybe 19, 20 percent of their cases. We probably hear oral argument in 60 percent of our cases. So there are wide variations around the country. But back in the, back in the mid-1960s, of course, you had oral argument. Um, now, what happens now is that there'll be a conference for the non-argued cases of three judges. We call them our Rule 34 cases, which refers to the rule of appellate procedure that allows us to do this. And Judge Fairchild participated in those conferences. Literally, I sat in on one of those conferences that he was doing by telephone. I'm sure it was maybe about 10 days before he passed away. He knew everything about every case. He knew everything that the Supreme Court had been doing that was pertinent, made interesting suggestions about how we might think about the case. It was, it was really wonderful to work with him. When he joined the Court of Appeals, there was no such thing as a so-called unpublished case or a non-precedential case. Everything that the courts did was automatically published. Again, that's just what you did. Uh, and one of the efficiency measures that the courts undertook, this was primarily uh, done over the course of the decade of the 1970s was to institute the device of the so-called unpublished opinion. And back in those days, I think it really meant unpublished opinion. I think it meant it got filed in some file cabinet in the clerk's office, never to be seen again, except that the parties might have, I mean, I'm sure the parties got a copy of it, but no one else would have really had much access to it. Over time, the idea of unpublished became fictional because First of all, it was on the website of the court, and secondly, you know, Lexis and Westlaw and everybody else who wanted it, Find Law, uh, everybody would, would post it on their own sites, and 
uh, it was then West finally decided to publish something that they called the Federal Appendix. And so unpublished really meant it wasn't an F-third. Uh, but so now we don't, we've changed the vocabulary at the Seventh Circuit. We refer to them as non-precedential dispositions. Uh, so <laughs> we don't want you to cite them to us really, but if you insist, we will tell you it's non-presidential. Um, <laughs> so we don't have to follow it anyway. Um, but anyway, when Judge Fairchild joined the court, there was none of this you know, sort of fine tuning of what kind of case was what sort of case and what were you gonna pay attention to and what were you not. Uh, so, so that was a big change. Certainly the larger staff was another change. Uh, developments in technology have changed considerably. Uh, the court now does virtually everything you know, by computer and by email. Right before I left uh, to come up here, I made sure I had uploaded on my laptop the briefs for all of the cases that I have for the next time I'm hearing oral arguments uh, because it's a lot easier to carry one laptop around with briefs uploaded onto it than it is a giant stack of, of briefs. So, so all of those things have changed our work, hopefully have made us more efficient, and we hope have not, uh, at least too much, compromise the quality of the work we're doing. I have a colleague, uh, our, now our chief judge is Frank Easterbrook, but uh, Judge Joel Flom, up until November, was our chief judge. And uh, Joel likes to say, you know, we have to really worry about these non-precedential dispositions, because if you just tell people affirmed, or reversed, which is what some of the courts of appeals do. He's afraid that we're gonna look like the Emperor Nero coming out onto the balcony saying thumbs up or thumbs down and not quite the image that you want uh, from a real court. And certainly not a problem at the time Judge Fairchild began his, his career in the Seventh Circuit. Now, let me turn to Judge Fairchild then and, and look a little more closely at what he was doing on the Seventh Circuit. His commission was signed by President Johnson on August 11th, 1966, and he took the oath of office on August the 24th. Now, the key fact for any member of the Court of Appeals is the date of commission. Everything flows from it. Where you sit, you know, where your picture hangs in the courtroom, you know, how you march in, all sorts of things like that. And uh, so Judge Fairchild's commission was August 11th, and that governed his place in the pecking order. The first opinion that I was able to find that he authored was an appeal in a tax case, a case dealing, uh, called Green versus Commissioner of Internal Revenue, dealing with whether something should have been characterized as interest income or capital gain. Now that's, that's an issue we could think about today. People who do tax practices uh, regularly deal with that. Interestingly, Judge Fairchild was not the junior judge on the panel. That person was Walter Cummings. Walter, who also had a commission dated August the 11th, 1966, but we have a rule for that. If you have the same commission, then you look at the birthday. And since Walter's birthday was, was a little bit, uh, you know, Walter was a little bit younger than, than Judge Fairchild. He was therefore junior uh, to Judge Fairchild. And um, that was why he was the junior judge on that panel. Now, the opinion in some ways is, is a very standard opinion. It's not a Chicago 7 kind of case for which the judge rightly became famous some years later. It's a very concise, workmanlike, two pages long. It's actually a joy to read. It's, it's very clear, sets forth some principles, again, that we would follow today and find very familiar. A court should look at the substance of a transaction, not the form and you should defer to the factual findings of a lower court unless they were clearly erroneous and so forth. I mean, it's a, it's a very nice little opinion. Over the year or so of his first year on the bench, Judge Fairchild authored 28 signed opinions. And I found it remarkable just to see what the subject matters were. Eight of them, 29% were in diversity cases. That is to say, cases that come up between citizens of different states that deal fundamentally with matters of state law, cases that would have felt very familiar to him, even though some were from Illinois and Indiana, but the truth is, you know, for all that we have different states, the laws don't vary that much. You can figure out where the differences are and apply them as you need to. Another seven were criminal appeals, but not in, in crimes that we see as much of now, uh, mail fraud, 
two heroin cases, a Hobbs Act extortion case, somebody was uh, indicted for mailing threatening letters uh, and a criminal tax offense, uh, the sort of things he had. Four opinions dealt with patent law. Now, this happens to be an area, if you look at Judge Fairchild's oral history, which he did with our circuit executive, Collins Fitzpatrick, a few years ago, Judge Fairchild enjoyed the patent cases. Uh, Congress decided um, in 1982 that it was going to take patent cases away from the regional courts of appeals and give them to a specialized federal court called the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. So it did that, but I think Judge Fairchild regretted the loss of, of the patent cases. So he's delving into you know, the way these machines work and is it obvious or not? Is this really sort of a spark of genius that led to this new invention or is it some sort of workmanlike ordinary uh, advance in the law? So he had some fun with these patent cases. And then they're you know, just kind of say miscellaneous, National Labor Relations Board, another one from the tax court, a couple of prisoner complaints and, and so on. So that was what he was, he was doing. And this is a time, by the way, again, getting back to oral argument. In 1967, there's an interesting note from the Advisory Committee on Rules of Procedure. They were worrying about whether 30 minutes aside was too stringent a limitation on oral argument. And they said, well, 30 minutes is OK, as long as it's clear that the judges can give extra time if need be. We give 10 minutes aside regularly all the time now, uh, assuming that we're even giving oral arguments. So again, times change. Um, time doesn't really permit looking at all these uh, opinions, but one, there, there are a couple of themes, I think, that tell you something about the judge's idea of fairness. A consistent theme over and over again. He says, a district judge got rid of the case too quickly. The person deserves a full hearing. You shouldn't have granted summary judgment. You should look more carefully at the pleadings. Give this person his or her day in court. So that, that theme comes through all of these cases. Uh, he's, he's very um, satisfied to uphold a jury verdict for plaintiffs or defendants. Some of the jury verdicts were for defendants, some were for plaintiffs, but the jury is an institution that he clearly trusts. The jury is there and the kinds of arguments you might make about overturning jury verdicts or something that he, he held people to a high standard before he would do that. Um, there's nothing, as, as I said, too, too unusual about the law. What's startling to me is what's not there. Not a single cocaine case. Not a single case about methamphetamines. Nothing about marijuana. There are these two heroin cases, that's it. No immigration cases. There have been days that I've heard eight immigration cases out of nine appeals. Um, no immigration cases. There was one social security disability case. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's really a different mixture of cases that are coming to the courts of appeals in this period of time, the mid-60s. And the only other thing I want to say about this period is there was one interesting case. The district judges apparently had gotten into the habit at this time of telling the jury and I will quote from one of his cases, quote, every witness is presumed to speak the truth, but this presumption may be outweighed by various things that he listed. Judge Fairchild writes a number of opinions in which he says, no, that's wrong. There's no such presumption. That's really unfair to the defendant. It's really up to the jury on a clean slate. The jury can decide if witness A is telling the truth. The jury can decide witness A is not telling the truth. There's no thumb on the scale about this. And again, this is this incredible sense of, of fairness. And finally, in the first year that he was on the court, he wrote an opinion for the in-bank court, that is to say the entire court sitting together. Um, and this had to do, kind of alludes to another part of his life, had to do with the proper way of presenting an insanity defense in a criminal case. He goes through a very scholarly discussion of the development of the insanity defense, um, and then, having laid that all out, he turns to what was then the proposed official draft of the model penal code that the American Law Institute was then developing. The model penal code has long since you know, been out for pretty much since then, since, since the mid-1960s. And it shouldn't have surprised someone who knew him well. The judge was a lifelong member of the ALI. He served with distinction for many years on the council of the ALI. Um, and he 
he's very clear that he's talking, and here's the definition the AOI has proposed, here's why I think it's a better way of phrasing this than the alternative. He actually identifies three things that he likes better about it. The, the alternative uh, for the first element was you had to decide whether the person was in a perverted and deranged condition, and the ALI language in the model penal code referred to mental disease or defect. So Judge Fairchild thought that was a more productive way of asking that question. The second element, uh, the other way of doing it would have been to say, is the person incapable of distinguishing between right and wrong or of knowing the nature of the act? And the model penal code ALI version speaks of one who lacks substantial capacity to appreciate the criminality or wrongfulness of his conduct. And again, traditionally, the question was, has there been, in a sense, a complete destruction of the person's independent will? And the ALI definition refers to one who lacks substantial capacity to, to conform his conduct to the requirements of law. It was a, a controversial decision within the court. There are four people, uh, four members of the court, who write separately, objecting in various ways to the adoption of the ALI's formulation. But the judge is already clearly a leader on the court. He's He's writing uh, for the in-bank court, and, and that's always uh, an important function uh, to, to play. So what I'm going to do now is jump up 10 years um, and look at 1976. By 1976, Judge Fairchild is the chief judge of the court. He succeeded to that position on February 7, 1975, when Luther Schweiger stepped down. So. Being chief judge carries with it not only the responsibility to continue being a full-fledged member of the court, but there are all sorts of administrative things that, that go along with it, too. It's, it's a certain drain on, on the person's time, but he's still very actively involved uh, in the court's work. Still criminal law, diversity, now prisoners' rights are making, making their way into the docket. Intellectual property still there, a patent case, a copyright case. And then just kind of a, a bigger variety of cases, a habeas case, National Labor Relations Board, this and that. Um, so he's, he's got a variety of cases that year. And there's a hint, interestingly, in one of the opinions that the court was already starting in 1976 to think about whether it really wanted to, quote unquote, publish its opinions or not. He says at the end of a bankruptcy case, we have cast this decision as a published opinion for future guidance in the Northern District of Illinois. And then he goes on to explain what it is he thought they needed guiding on. Um, <laughs> so I'm sure they were glad to hear that. Um, but uh, anyhow, again, the, the overall number of the cases isn't as, as high as it, as it later would have become uh, for an active judge. Um, in the copyright case, uh, another sign of the times, Judge uh, Fairchild's panel affirms a decision by then District Judge Joel Flom, who I mentioned a few minutes ago, who later came to the Seventh Circuit and later was chief. Um, Judge Fairchild alludes to the new federal rules of evidence. Federal rules of evidence have not been around forever. The federal rules of evidence came along uh, in the mid-1970s. And by now, length is getting to be a thing. You know, we don't have these nice two and three page opinions anymore. This one is a big set of 15 page thing in which he finds uh, that certain patents are valid and infringed and uh, looks like it, uh, looks like today's cases really. All right, the prisoner cases are still about the same as what we see today. And I, as I thought about that, I thought, I'm not sure if that's a, a good news story or a bad news story. Um, Maybe it means that uh, we really still haven't made too much progress uh, in this area. In one of the cases, a class of pretrial detainees in Cook County said that they were being subjected to constitutionally inadequate facilities for recreation, exercise, and reading, and that they should not have been deprived of visiting privileges with family and friends. And I think, I mean, when I think of this, it just blows my mind in some ways. And that they should be permitted to earn money for bond and defense purposes. I'm not sure what they were planning on doing, actually. I couldn't quite tell from, from reading the opinion. But the district judge had thrown out the case and said, oh, you know, you guys are pretrial detainees. Don't bother me. Judge Fairchild was not going to do that. He said, no, uh, first of all, pretrial detainees are in a different position from convicted prisoners. They aren't convicted of anything. There's a presumption of innocence. 
They, as he writes, and he says it best, strictly speaking, he wrote, pretrial detainees may not be punished at all because they have been convicted of no crime. The sole permissible interest of the state is to ensure their presence at trial. Well, uh, that's, that is not language you would be likely to see in an opinion today, I promise you, even though it's certainly recognized that pretrial detainees theoretically are in a different position from people who've been convicted already. Uh, but at this point in time, what that mostly means is if you're complaining about bad treatment, you can't look at the Eighth Amendment because it can't be cruel and unusual punishment because it wasn't punishment. So instead, you look at the Due Process Clause, and then there are 500 cases that say the standards under the Due Process Clause are actually about the same as the standards under the Eighth Amendment, so you loop back and use the Eighth Amendment through the back door. That was not happening uh, at the time of this called Duran against Elrod, uh, the case I'm talking about. So Judge Fairchild says, these prisoners have stated a claim. It's a class action. Maybe they're not being treated properly. Uh, let them have their day in court. Again, uh, this, this theme that runs throughout his, his jurisprudence. Um, one of the diversity cases uh, looks a lot like the cases. You know, we still, we still have diversity cases. Um, and it was a case dealing with a, a dangerous machine uh, where a court, where the court affirms a verdict in the in favor of the boy who's, who had been mangled by this machine. And you don't really have too much to say. He's got criminal law and employment discrimination. You're starting to get cases under Title VII at this point quite regularly. Now, when you jump ahead to 1986, now all of a sudden the judge is a senior judge. Uh, he took senior status on August 31st, 1981, when he was statutorily entitled to do so. In fact, he probably could have done it before that. Passed the reins of the chief judgeship along to the junior Walter Cummings. Um, and as a senior judge, many, many of you would know this, uh, one can sit as much or as little really as one is comfortable doing. You have to have the chief judge certify you for service but today, for example, one of the senior judges on our court, Bill Bauer, takes a 100% caseload. Other people might decide they want to take a 50% caseload, or other people might decide it would be fun to sit out, you know, they've got a daughter in the Ninth Circuit or something, so they go sit in San Francisco some of the time, or, or whatever. And then courts are very grateful for the help, actually. Um, so Judge Fairchild took senior status and continued, actually, to keep a very demanding caseload. Um, so the accumulated record for 1986 really doesn't look too different from what we saw in the previous couple of decades uh, when he was still first uh, an active judge in the court and then chief judge for criminal cases, for diversity cases, a habeas matter, a Title VII case involving religious discrimination, duty to arbitrate under a collective bargaining agreement, all very standard things. The one that stands out both for poundage and for coverage in that period of time is a really long opinion that he wrote in a case called the United States Against Kimberlin. It's 44 pages long, his opinion alone, in the Federal Reporter, which is like a class in criminal procedure. Uh, if, if any of the professors here want to save uh, time and photocopying money for the students, all they would have to do <laughs> is reproduce Kimberlin and then go to town. You know, validity of admitting testimony of certain witnesses who'd been hypnotized, jury questions about voir dire and sequestration, speedy trial rights, suggestive photographic array for identification, Fourth Amendment issues and searches and seizures, and on and on and on. There, there were all sorts of things. This guy had, had, had uh, set off, uh, I think, eight bombs uh, someplace in Indiana. Uh, so. It's, it's a very, very thorough treatment of this and clearly uh, something that he took great care with. Uh, in the end, interestingly, he decides, although maybe it wasn't a perfect trial, the conviction had to be affirmed. Uh, and Judge Cudahy, also uh, on the court by this time, wrote a brief concurring opinion. I think what he had to say about Judge Fairchild's opinion was very interesting. He stresses how close some of the calls were in this case, but he writes at the end, Although these and a number of other problems are very troubling, I think the majority has addressed them conscientiously and in a fashion that sustains the result. So that's, that's what you're trying to do in a 
it was nice that Judge Cuddy said that. So then we jump up the next decade and Judge Fairchild is still working with the court, still on senior status. And I would, I would say as a footnote here, it's really important to recognize what an incredible act of generosity this is on the part of the senior judges. Senior Article III judges essentially work for free. Why is that? Because Article III of the Constitution guarantees to federal judges, as I'm sure you all know, that they're to hold their offices during good behavior and their compensation can't be diminished. What does that mean? It means that a federal judge has the right, although not the obligation, to remain in office until he's carried out feet first. Uh, and some judges have gone around telling people that that's their plan. Um, if they do, their pay can't be diminished. So there are no sticks that Congress can use to induce somebody to leave the federal judiciary. You're going to be paid, you, you can just stay there forever and just keep the seat warm as an active judge if you want to. That barring, of course, you know, committing some impeachable offense, which really thankfully does not happen too often. So what Congress has done instead is gone the carrot route. It has said, once you reach the age of 65, if you've served for 15 years, or you reach the age of 70 and you've served for 10 years, or any other combination after 65 that adds up to 80, you may step down from your position as an active judge and receive 100% of your salary plus all raises for the rest of your life. And if you just flat out retire and decide to go back to a law firm, you're still gonna get 100% of your salary for the rest of your life just no raises, and since we don't get raises anyway, you know, it's not, uh, <laughs> it's not really too much of a difference. What that means then is for a senior judge to continue working, the, that person would get that money anyway, whether there was no work, work, and in that sense, they're working for free. They are donating their time to the people, they are contributing to the court, they are playing an invaluable role and they're doing so just because, you know, I think they think it's important work, they like the work, it's something that engages them, it's nice to be able to make a contribution to society, et cetera. All of those really good things that we sometimes lose sight of that, that people are doing. So that's what Judge Fairchild was doing. He was just continuing to work as a member of the court on senior status, and he did that for more than 25 years. So by the time you get to 1994, you're getting a docket that looks very much like what I discovered in 1995 when I joined the court, habeas corpus opinions, criminal matters, a couple of diversity cases, federal civil law of various kinds. Judge Fairchild is still being assigned to write opinions for the in-bank court. He wrote one in-bank opinion uh, that year, uh, 1994 that is, in a case called United States against Hines, which has to do with the Cook County property tax being assessed on certain properties that the United States said were U.S. property. States can't tax federal property, but this wasn't quite federal property yet because the U.S. was paying for it on the installment plan, so they didn't have the title yet. So the court finds, okay, it's all right uh, for uh, Cook County to, to tax it. So there are, again, all sorts of uh, other things that, that come up. By this time, the judge was sitting around country, there's some opinions from the Ninth Circuit, some opinions from the Eighth, some opinions from, from other circuits, um, and the, the consistent theme here is that, that he, was, he was out there and, and contributing to uh, the work of the federal courts. Um, around 2002, 2003, he decided that he wasn't going to travel down to Chicago anymore, that had become more difficult for him but he continued to work with us, as I said, on the Rule 34 cases. We have all sorts of facilities. You can video conference in, you can telephone conference in. You really don't have to, to travel at all. Uh, and by the time, uh, just getting back to the story of the federal courts in general, by the time you get to 2005, 2006, uh, the, the docket is quite a different docket than the one that you would have looked at in 1966. Uh, I looked at my own cases and in, 19, and in 2006, it was criminal appeals, mostly cocaine, you know, drugs, a few bank robberies and mail frauds, civil rights cases, habeas, diversity cases. 
Lots of statutory cases. Congress in 1966 had just begun to pass a very large number of statutes that are now responsible for a good bit of the business of the federal courts. Uh, Congress has been asked by the judiciary many times to take into account the judicial impact of this kind of new legislation, but it sometimes does and sometimes it doesn't. Um, what has remained a constant over the years is the challenge and privilege of serving on a court like the Seventh Circuit. And I'll just add on a personal note that those of us who were fortunate enough to work with Judge Fairchild, as I was for more than 11 years, had a stellar example to follow. We all miss his deep commitment to justice, his empathy for the parties before him, his scrupulous attention to the law, and his cheerful companionship. This lecture in particular meant a great deal to him, and I thank the Fairchild clerks, the Fairchild family, University of Wisconsin for inviting me to deliver it. It's without a doubt the best way for all of us to carry on Judge Fairchild's legacy. <laughs> Thank you, Judge Wood, for an excellent presentation of the work. Not all cases are equal, although they try an equal treatment. So uh, some of your prisoner cases, for example, are not treated exactly the same as you do a full force. Isn't that one way that the court deals with these large numbers? Uh, so how many do you guess would be uh, prisoner cases? Then do you have a lot of immigration cases? Because my understanding is they may be treated somewhat differently. Well, you're right, of course, that not all cases are equal. And here you see an enormous difference in the way the different courts of appeals work. Because there are quite a few circuits, for example, just off the top of my head, the Fifth Circuit, the Eleventh Circuit, the Tenth Circuit, the Ninth Circuit, who have panels of three judges who actually screen every appeal that comes in to see whether the case is a hard enough case to require kind of full-blown attention, to require oral argument, the whole process. And those cases that don't require that are disposed of in, in orders. You'll have a heavier reliance on staff attorneys. You'll, you'll do other things with it. And hopefully, if the process is going well, that screening process is effective. Um, now, the circuits that do it, uh, and I, when I was a law clerk in the Fifth Circuit, that was one of the things that, that already existed then, do have a safeguard in this process in that any one judge of the panel of three who are doing the screening is entitled to say, I think there's something here. There's not a majority or anything. We do not do that in the Seventh Circuit. What we do instead is give oral argument to any case that's got a lawyer on both sides. Now, it could be these little shorties. It could be this 10 minutes aside kind of oral argument. And of course, uh, some cases are extremely straightforward. You'll see a sentencing appeal you know, with, with some uh, prisoner who thinks that a jury should decide beyond a reasonable doubt whether he had past convictions. And we have about 45 cases that say, no, the Supreme Court's never said that. And 
and that's that. It takes us about a minute to, to decide the case. In fact, to the point where I was in an oral argument, it was posted on our website, so I'm not telling you anything out of school, where a woman was making exactly that argument to us. And I said, you know, the problem is that the Supreme Court itself has not overruled the case. It says it's okay for the judge to find whether there are prior convictions. What do you really want us to do? If you want us to say you've preserved your argument so that you can now go ahead and present it to the Supreme Court, by all means, we'll say that. And she stood there for a minute, and actually I was very touched by this in a way, since she knew she really had nothing to argue about as far as I could tell. But she stood there for a minute and she said, I just want to be heard. And so she talked for another seven minutes. Um, <laughs> and, and, and we listened. But it's, it's, it's tough uh, in those cases. But we handle it by, by these shorter arguments and by the so-called unpublished orders. Now, with habeas corpus, it's different because co Congress has said that you can't take an appeal from a district court decision in a habeas case without a certificate of appealability. And the certificate of appealability can come either from the district judge or from one court of appeals judge in which you say there's a substantial issue of constitutional law and you have to identify what that issue is. A great number of habeas corpus cases are disposed of at the certificate of appealability level. If the district judge has said no, then it comes to a motions panel at the Court of Appeals. So whenever I'm doing motions, you'll get this mountain of certificate of appealabilities. And you look through them, and most of the time, not surprisingly, the district judge got it right. There really is no substantial question of constitutional law. So we don't have to hear a full appeal in those cases. All we have to do is agree with the district court judge that there's no substantial issue. Of course, the Supreme Court wrote an opinion, it's one of the Miller L opinions, um, in which they said substantial question doesn't mean you think they might win. Substantial question just has to mean that there's a fairly arguable point here. So they're trying to make sure that the, the bar isn't too high. Um, immigration is actually a, an example in the other direction because unfortunately in the immigration area through I'm not going to even call them reforms, through some procedural changes that were made around 1983 or 1980, or sorry, 2000, they were made by John Ashcroft, 2003, 2004. They had too many appeals before the Board of Immigration Appeals. So former Attorney General Ashcroft decided to shrink the number of people on the Board of Immigration Appeals from 23 down to 11 and to delegate the power to a single member of the board to affirm without opinion. It's a very interesting study in administrative law for those of you who have an interest in this area because the BIA started, you know, they took out their rubber stamp and started saying affirmed without opinion. And people felt that they had not had their hearing. And so the level of appeals that were coming to the courts of appeals and frankly the complexity of those appeals skyrocketed in the Second Circuit they had regularly a filing load of about 4,800 cases a year. It went up by another 1,200 cases because of these immigration appeals. They were drowning. They had to institute new procedures. Judge Newman of that court was the point person for it. The same sort of thing, not quite at that level, but the same sort of thing happened to us and every other court of appeals. And we discovered that the immigration judges were not paying attention to the record. They were deporting people to the wrong country. They were, um, you know, one of them that I had, I remember, failed to recognize that back in 1981 the Soviet Union had broken up. So sending somebody from, who was from Kiev back to Moscow was actually now the wrong country. Um, it, it, it's actually catastrophe uh, in the immigration areas. So it takes us much more time than it should. Um, so it really depends, but the way, the way we do it, there certainly are areas where time saving because of the lack of complexity of the case is possible, but not as many as, as you might think. Yes? I, I'd like you to do a little research for me. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I just need the site to judge Fairchild's insanity model penal code case. Oh, so when I you get a chance, that after. good, thank you. <laughs> Of course, the court has to save time. Uh, 
uh, looked at from the court standpoint, you can understand it. Looked at from the litigant standpoint and the lawyer standpoint, you practice in Madison, Wisconsin. If you drive to Chicago and the uh, uh, freeway isn't all backed up, you might make it two and a half, three and a half hours, depending on what you hit. So it's two and a half, three and a half hours down, two and a half, three and a half hours back for 10 minutes. Why bother? It's an excellent question, and I will tell you that you're touching on something that's a matter of debate within the Seventh Circuit anyway right now, and that is, should we make available to lawyers who wish to do so, this is not something we would ever force anybody to do, but should we make video argument available? If you, the lawyer in Madison, could come here to the law school or to a facility in your law firm and establish a video link, with the Seventh Circuit, make your 10 minute argument. You haven't, you, you know, you're quite right. You've wasted a day if you have to drive down to Chicago, by the, even if you're like me and it doesn't take quite two and a half hours to, to do it. Um, <laughs> but, but, but your point is a very important one and some of the courts of appeals have started to do this. There are some people on our court who are very reluctant to take that step. They, they like having the person in the room and they're afraid that, I, I'm not sure, they're, they're afraid that somehow it, we will lose all human contact if we go down that road. It's a slippery slope. The truth is even now we allow lawyers, um, they tend to be people snowed in in Wisconsin actually, we allow <laughs> lawyers to argue by a telephone link. You know, We get this desperate phone call from them the night before saying, we're sorry, you know, we just can't make it down, so we'll give permission and let them argue by phone. Um, but, but I think that there is every reason to explore this. I'm not sure as the technology gets better that it's such a bad choice. And if it's the difference between being able to have your, your 10 minutes or, or not, and the federal public defenders, the U.S. attorneys, there are a lot of people, small practitioners, there are a great number of people who have budgetary concerns that would not do it, then, then you'd say, well, you know, what about the big firms? Maybe they'll always come in person. Is that gonna give them some financial advantage that's unfair? I'm not sure. Um, yeah. Professor McCauley was one of my favorite professors in law school, and he still could, <laughs> but I would say that um, as a lawyer who has regularly appeared in the Seventh Circuit on CJA appointments for criminal cases, which I didn't try, I would never give up that 10 minutes. I think I owe it to the client. And I hope the court just maintains what it does and uh, at least is essentially a volunteer. I don't mind making the trip. Well, I'm very glad to hear that. And I will say from the side of the, of the bench I'm on, uh, that 10 minutes can be very valuable. You know, I spend a lot of time thinking about what are the key questions that I want to get the lawyer's response to. And actually, it doesn't take too long you know, to get to the heart of the case and say, please let me know, you know what you think about, you know, what's the state of the record on this, or did whatever the thing is. And you know, a well-prepared lawyer will be ready to answer that, and I feel much better about the case once I've had that interchange. Yes, ma'am. Oh dear, it's, <laughs> let me just say there's a real range. Um, <laughs> some briefs are great, you know, they get right to the point, they, they don't, they're not too long, they're actually briefs, they're not longs, um, and they, they tell you what you need to know. It, it's a rare case, it's not unheard of, but it's a rare case where you really have to use the full 14,000 words that we al allow people. Um, I think the most important thing about writing a good brief is actually to understand you know, the theory of your case and to know what it is you want the court to do. Um, you present the facts in a more organized way at that point. You, you have the, the issues there. You don't have seven or eight different issues. You have to make the sometimes painful decision, you know, which ones are the issues that are really worthy of appeal. You've, you've got to winnow even further if you're gonna to go to a Supreme Court, whether it's a state Supreme Court or the US Supreme Court. You can't just 
throw in, you should have believed my expert witness. You know, you've got to think of the standard of review. We're not going to we're not going to overrule a district court on a great number of judgments like, you know, was this ex expert more credible than that expert or those kinds of things. There are good reasons for a deferential standard of review for some things. And if you don't, I mean, I, th I know it's a hard decision for criminal lawyers to make, but sometimes a criminal lawyer really should consider filing an Anders brief, a no merit brief, as opposed to, uh, you know, a brief with a, with a doomed issue. You know, the jury shouldn't have believed, you know, the witnesses that said that my client sold, you know, two kilos of, of cocaine because the witnesses were all part of the cocaine conspiracy. Well, that's those witnesses. You know, juries get to decide that. That's not a good argument to make on appeal. So you need to think of what's the appellate court doing. People who remember standard of review, who remember what they want the court to do, who remember, you know, how to tell a story with the facts that, that make some sense, we'll write a good brief. Some of the worst briefs, um, I can remember some briefs where they think they have to tell you what each witness said, seriatim, and you're sitting there, you know, waiting for then A said this, then you're kind of trying to put the whole thing together, and that's, that's not helpful. And my final comment on briefs, um, one of my pet peeves about briefs, is what I refer to as the ships passing in the night briefs. You know, one side writes a brief, and the other side writes another brief, and it doesn't, and you're thinking, well, is this actually still the same case? You know, or, or what, what's happening here? And if you don't engage in the other party's argument, you're doing something really silly, because the court is going to decide for itself without any input from you as to what to do with the other party's argument. And you shouldn't do that. Um, so there's, uh, there's a lot people can do to make their briefs better that's really not rocket science. It's just paying attention to the case and hopefully writing well. Um, this is sort of going to the caseload issue uh, in, a, in a kind of roundabout way. I had a case once where Judge Fairchild issued the ruling, wrote the opinion, and it involved a, a criminal case where there was a constitutional, alleged constitutional error at trial. The defense attorney failed to object, and then the same attorney represented the defendant on appeal and failed to raise the issue then. And so there's all these procedural potential things going on. And in the opinion, Judge Fairchild said, let's basically, let's cut to the chase. If there was a constitutional error at trial, then we've got this double ineffective claim, and we'll just look and see whether there was a constitutional error at trial. And my client lost, but it was, it was a good ruling in the sense that it really said, okay, let's just get to the merits of this issue. And I feel, you know, reading federal post-conviction cases, federal uh, inmate civil rights cases, to some extent habeas corpus cases, that there's a kind of dog chasing its tail quality to a lot of the opinions which I realize are influenced by statute and other case law, but do you guys get frustrated about, you know, can't we just sort of cut to the chase and say, no, it really doesn't matter about the peanut butter in the cell and we're not going to talk about exhaustion of remedies or whatever it is? Well, to some extent we can do that. Now, sometimes I, I tell people that, at least in my opinion, habeas corpus has taken on some of the quality of the forms of action at common law. I mean, it's <laughs> so complicated in these days. We expect these prisoners, who usually start out pro se, to understand you know, exactly when should they file, and did they exhaust, and is there procedural default, and as was there fair presentment, and all these all these ways, you know, it's, it's like a, a kid's game. You know, there are 10 different ways to fall off the tracks, and only a few people are going to make it all the way to the end. Most of these things uh, are not jurisdictional. And if it's not, it, once you're talking about post conviction, once you're talking about habeas corpus, um, maybe you have to filter it through effective assistance of counsel first before you can get to that underlying constitutional problem. Uh, but there, there is some flexibility. The, the problem is always, I think, fairness to both sides in the end, oftentimes fairness to the state. If, let's say, that effective assistance of counsel claim was never raised at the state court level, then there is something inappropriate about the federal court saying, well, you know, they should have recognized somehow that there was an ineffective assistance of counsel claim instead of rejecting the underlying claim, maybe they rejected it because it was never raised and nobody said to them, oh, by the way, it was ineffective, where they could have focused on that. And 
then you, you lose the benefit of the adversary process if you're a believer in the adversary process at all. And so I always actually, when I look at default issues, one of the first questions I always ask myself is what would the other side have done if this had been raised properly to begin with? If there's something they would have wanted to say about it, if there's evidence they would have wanted to present, if another court might have had some opportunity to correct a problem, then I'm probably more likely to say that the, the default mattered if I don't think it really makes any difference and everybody was talking about it anyway and it's clear that, that everyone knew what was going on, then I'm much more likely to think it didn't, you know, you can go ahead and decide the case. Judge, you said that you haven't seen much change in the content of prisoner lawsuits over time. But what about in the 11 years since the passage of the Prison Litigation Reform Act? Have you seen a change in the number of prisoner cases you're seeing and or the amount of time you're spending on those cases? Well, the Prison Litigation Reform Act took effect, if I'm remembering correctly, on April 24, 1996. So you would think by now, you know, it's 10 years later, give or take, um, <laughs> a few days. The truth is there aren't too many differences. There's, one of the most important things the PLRA does is it creates a system of strikes. And if a prisoner has filed three cases that are dismissed on certain grounds for failure to state a claim, for suing somebody who had <coughs> immunity, for being frivolous, then they get strikes. And if they get three strikes, then they can't file a lawsuit without pre, you know, without paying up the filing fee right away. They can't pay on the installment plan, which is what they otherwise do. The clerks of the courts are doomed you know, to taking $4.15 out of their prison account each month until they make up the, the filing fee. All right, so it turns out, actually, a lot of people are still filing cases. And a lot of the cases still look very much the same. The act probably has made a big difference in terms of the kind of injunctive relief in group actions that the district courts might give. You don't see nearly so many of those because it was designed to, to place some real obstacles in that, in that path. Um, but they file so many cases that our court has developed a couple of procedures to try to uh, get them to stop it. Uh, namely, we, you know, in one instance, we, there's a case we have called Support Systems, you probably know it, Support Systems Against Mac. And we call them our frequent filers. Uh, when the frequent filers come along you know, with the same thing over and over again, or this and that, and they're all just silly little things, we'll say, first of all, we'll say we're going to fine you, you know, we pick a number, $500 or something, um, as, as a sanction for filing a frivolous appeal from a frivolous lawsuit. And then we give them some time to see if they'll pay. And if they don't pay after a certain amount of time, we bar them from filing any further cases in the courts of the Seventh Circuit, with the exception of defending themselves in a criminal case, collateral petitions, um, or you know, they can move for permission uh, to, to file a case. And so we have MAC orders outstanding against a certain number of prisoners. And then we have other orders, even in the habeas corpus cases. Now you can't file a second or successive habeas corpus petition. Uh, on the same underlying conviction unless you get the permission of the Court of Appeals. So this is new work Congress has given to the Court of Appeals that we didn't have before where we have to review all of these applications for second or successive petitions. Um, now, they're actually never granted. I mean, in, t in 10 years, I can't actually remember ever granting. The, the standard is so high. And I think the reason is very simple. You would certainly grant one if there were clear and convincing evidence of innocence. But you know what? The state courts know that too. The state courts, when the DNA evidence you know, exonerates somebody, it never gets to the, court of, to the federal court of appeals, in Illinois at least, and we keep having these people who are you know, exonerated because of DNA, and the state courts are taking care of that entirely. Now, if it happened to be a federal prisoner, maybe it would come up, but I suspect the, uh, the government wouldn't take an appeal on that end either. So uh, these second or successive petitions are an enormous amount of paperwork. And I, of course, do the job. But I worry about it as, as being something that's almost fraudulent. It looks like you have an extra chance, and you really don't. <laughs>
uh, is not likely to happen. Why don't we make that the last question, and I hope everybody will join us um, and join the judge for our reception outside. So uh, thank you all for